Welcome to the broadcast tonight. The death of Pol Pot, what it means in terms of history, perspective, and review. Dr. Henry Kissinger. But it's not going to be a model democracy, and uh, the suffering that these people have undergone must have produced a rift in that society and in the souls of people that will take a long time to heal. And the death of Pol Pot will not cure that either. No. And the incredible trumpet player, Wynton Marsalis, and his new album. The feeling, the feeling that you get from playing and uh, getting things out, the ideas come to you and you get to put them down. And also when you work, you, you stay prepared for things when they come to you. And that, that's, that's, the, that's really the, it's like you're always, in a, you're always ready. We conclude with the scientist from Harvard who's won two Pulitzer Prizes for his writing, E.O. Wilson. Many people think that uh, scientists proceed by some kind of uh, iron-clad um, literal system of logic, looking at masses of data and then deciding that there's some kind of, of relationship or law there that they must puzzle out, like working a Sunday crossword puzzle. That isn't the way science works at all. The greatest scientist, Einstein's example, Newton, another, take great leaps of the imagination. Kissinger, Marsalis, and Wilson, when we continue. Charlie Rose is made possible by USA Networks as part of our continuing commitment to innovative television. Through USA Network and the Sci-Fi Channel, we provide original entertainment to America and the world. Anywhere. Any time, any book, barnesandnoble.com, where the world shops for books. Cisco Systems, the company that brought the Internet to business, is pleased to help bring the Charlie Rose Show to PBS. Cisco Systems, empowering the Internet generation. Charlie Rose is also made possible by these funders, and by Bloomberg, a provider of multimedia news and information services worldwide. From our studios in New York City, this is Charlie Rose. Khmer Rouge officials announced that Pol Pot, the architect of Cambodia's killing fields, died last night. It is still unclear whether his death was a result of a heart attack, as was reported, or from a natural causes. Pol Pot was believed responsible for the deaths of nearly two million Cambodians during his reign of terror in the 1970s. After a coup last year removed him from power, the Khmer Rouge leadership indicated that they were willing to turn him over to international authorities last week. Joining me now for a conversation about the life of this leader now dead and also Cambodia former Secretary of State Dr. Henry Kissinger welcome Great to good to be here thank you put this guy in perspective in terms of history the context of evil the context of what he meant in the flow of history well Pol Pot and his group was a weird combination of sort of French rationalism and communist ideology one of his colleagues uh, uh, Kyum Sampan, I think his name was, wrote a PhD thesis in France in the 50s in which he said that if communists ever took power in Cambodia, uh, they would have to, should exterminate all the people with education, all the vestiges of the bourgeois culture. And he accused of Mao and Stalin of having been too soft because they left kernels of the old society. So, uh, this was the group uh, that took over there in uh, 1975 at the end of the Cambodian Civil War in which, I must say to our shame, the American Congress cut off support to the government that was... The uh, government of Lon Nol. The government of uh, Lon Nol. Well, he had left by then, but anyway, the, uh, the government of, uh, of Cambodia. Nobody, in fairness to those people who, uh, who did this, nobody could imagine what would happen. Because there were many people who, would argue, who argued at the time that ending the war was preferable to 
anything that might happen as a result. As soon as the uh, uh, Khmer Rouge came into Phnom Penh, they emptied the city. L everybody had to leave the city, including patients in hospitals. And they were sent out into the countryside and into the jungles, where there was absolutely no means of supporting them. So certainly tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, died in that first evacuation. Then they killed, together with their families, every member of the previous administration, everybody who had any education at all, uh, and anybody else that they thought might conceivably have elements of what they called bourgeois culture. They took children from their parents and put the parents into barracks. They wanted to break up family ties. And they killed those two million people, which was over a third of the population, or nearly a third of the population, in two years. And they did it manually. They didn't have extermination. I mean, they beat them to death. Uh, most of the time, they beat them to death. And the world stood are, by. And, we, well, and the world stood by. Well, the world stood by, uh, again, those of us who were in the government at the time, didn't want to stand by originally. Then, when uh, the, be the killing began, we tried to tell newspapers what we picked up from their radio instructions to their subordinates. And I don't blame the journalists. Uh, they couldn't believe it. And they thought this was just another gimmick to uh, keep it going. And by the time that everybody knew uh, it was fairly well along, but still, it was unforgivable. The world should have intervened. Was it unforgivable? Did, did this government, the government that you served, other Western governments bear some responsibility for Pol Pot coming to power <laughs> and having the opportunity? Well, you know, this is, uh, this is the year of apologies yes. and of self-flagellation. Uh, it's, a, it's a curious, and, and a lot of people, it was an argument that was made at the time by people who were looking for alibis. The fact is, what is said is that the bombing radicalized them. We were bombing Vietnamese on Cambodian territory who were killing Americans at the rate of 500 a week. And we were bombing Khmer Rouge who were killing Cambodians. And it takes a really circuitous reasoning to say, that those who try to resist the Khmer Rouge taking over are responsible for the Khmer Rouge taking over. That's like saying the people who bombed Hitler are responsible for the genocide. Looking back, as you wrote your memoirs, would you have done what differently? In Cambodia? Mm -hmm. uh, look, we... Uh, the administration I served took over at a time when there were already 550,000 Americans uh, in Indochina. And we wanted to extricate them. And in retrospect, it's always easy to say this or that could have been done, uh, could have been done uh, differently. Uh, probably what I would say in retrospect is if we had done the things we did over three years all at once, it might have been more effective, but we had riots in this country. One forgets we had these, we had demonstrations. We had no choice, in my view, except a total collapse in Vietnam, or to try to get out gradually. And for that, it was essential that the killing of the Americans in South Vietnam stop. Uh, we were taking out at the rate of 150,000 Americans a year. And so, uh, anyway, this was the reasoning that got us involved. But I really think it's important for Americans. Uh, uh, not everything in the world is America's fault. And when you have a bunch of killers who killed two million of their own population, it really did America try to resist. It takes a real stretch of the imagination to say that this is somehow America's fault. Once the Vietnamese came in and support, did what they did and, in a sense, kicked the Khmer Rouge out. Should there have been, we're looking at history 
with 2020 hindsight. Should there have been an effort to somehow bring him to justice for the blood well, of two million people? What happened when the Vietnamese, the Vietnamese came in, I think it was two years or three years after the collapse in 78, I think the Vietnamese right. came in. And uh, the people they put into power in Phnom Penh were associates of Pol Pot. They had broken with Pol Pot on the issue of relationships with Vietnam. Right. So and therefore they, they had the support. That's right. They weren't the much. They weren't much better than uh, than Pol Pot was. Uh, and it, in those days, the Khmer Rouge was still a fairly strong fighting force. But it would certainly have been. It would have behooved humanity to take a stronger position towards the killing going on in, your, in Cambodia. Is that true? But I'm now looking after that. The after he is thrown out of power. Uh, after, well, he was thrown out of power, but then he went into, into the mountains and into the jungle and still led a fairly effective resistance. And then, actually, some countries, the Chinese in particular, supported Pol Pot as a counterweight to the Vietnamese-supported right. people. And we at least tolerated it. And, and that's my uh, question to you. I, I don't did, approve did power of that. politics get, take over? I, I normally support power politics, right. but there is a limit. I mean, when you have the genocide like Hitler, right, and the genocide like Pol Pot, then there the moral outrage has to predominate over any considerations of. Uh, power politics. And this is clearly where whatever interest we had with whatever government, somebody I, should have... I would not have dealt with Pol Pot for any purpose whatsoever. How power does, politics or anything else. He could not have survived without some kind of cover, some kind of support from somebody, could he? Well, he got some support from... The problem was this, that the Thais and the Chinese did not want the Vietnamese dominated Indochina. Right. Uh, we didn't want uh, the Vietnamese to dominate. So I don't believe we did anything for Pol Pot. But I suspect we closed our eyes when some others did something for Pol Pot. In, uh, in other, not the administration which I, I served, know, I know. but... Uh, we closed our eyes. When because we Thailand, did not want, because we, did, we had an interest with Thailand, so we closed our eyes to what they're doing and allowing him some kind of safe cover. Well, some access to military supplies. Exactly. I think he stayed on the Cambodian side of the border, but there were refugee camps. Uh, I visited the refugee camps in Thailand once yeah. because I felt terrible about what had happened in Cambodia, and it was a terrible thing to see. But there was one area of refugees, refugee camps adjoining the Pol Pot area, which were really taken over by the Khmer Rouge, and no American was permitted in there. So you had no access to that place? No. And the Thais did not try to have access to that they place. They just said you can't go there. Yeah. They probably had access, but they didn't let me go there. Do you think he was killed, or you think he died of natural causes? Just I think my first instinct when I heard it, yeah. was that it was so convenient for the leadership. Uh, they had been defeated. Uh, many of them had joined the government. Uh, obviously, some discussions were going on, and obviously Pol Pot was supposed to be offered up as a prize either to the international community or to the government in Phnom Penh. And it was probably too embarrassing to imagine what he might say if he were turned over. So my first instinct was that if he died of natural causes, he picked a very convenient moment for his colleagues. But killing one more person is no moral obstacle to them. Yeah. So, but who would have done it? The, the, I would think his. Who his, had the motive his, to do it? His colleagues in the Khmer Rouge. In the Khmer Rouge. But oh, they're yeah. on the run now, aren't they? Yeah, but his unit. I mean, he was allegedly kept under house arrest right. by the successors. And all of that is very murky because yeah. you didn't really know whether that it was true. Uh, he had been so discredited that the Khmer Rouge were trying to get still some international support and also trying to get some access to the government. So I'm not even sure that he was ever really deposed. Uh, but 
whatever ending he had uh, was too kind. He was uh, one of the cruelest men uh, that has ever governed. That's what that was my original question, put him in the context. He clearly is one of the cruelest leaders ever. Ever. I mean, the idea that you take over your country and... Uh, uh, we, we were worried what would happen when the communists took over, but not in our wildest imagination. It never occurred to us that they would just empty out the cities. Well, nothing happened in Vietnam like happening with Motor Man. No, it's, what they did, what we at the Mies did was no joyride. They had concentration camps and they put hundreds of thousands in there, but there wasn't any mass killing and it wasn't done by whole categories and exterminating all the families. Someone said today that it was the last gasp of sort of his failure in Cambodia, beyond the tragedy of the loss, also marked the last gasp of sort of a violent communist revolution. That's probably true. It was, I don't think it could happen that way today because nobody believes in communism to that extent. The Khmer Rouge leadership seems to have believed that Stalin and Mao were too soft and that they had left the vestiges of a bourgeois counter-revolution alive. That could rise up against him or whatever. Yeah, it actually turned out to be, yeah. be right. Uh, they, didn't get into, they didn't do enough if they were trying to protect themselves. If, if preserving communism at all right. costs was the objective. And so they decided they were going to re-educate a whole people. So anybody who ever had any education had to be killed. And then their families had to be killed because they might want to avenge their parents. And they wanted to start re starting They wanted to get control of the education of children from day one. They separated them from their families. Uh, people had to live in barracks, work in the fields. To the end, he evidently never expressed any remorse, basically said he made tactical mistakes. Yeah. And it was, it was, that was, it was the system. I mean, there was no mistake. It isn't that somebody got killed by mistake. They had clear-cut categories. I mean, when, when it happened first, we received radio instructions that they sent to their cadres in the field. And so where they ordered them to kill categories of people, we had, we, even we couldn't believe it. Okay, let's take me down this what if. If, in fact, you had said, you had said, this is unacceptable, was it feasible to do, within the context of all the other things that were on the plate at the time, to say, this is unacceptable to humanity, we're going to stop it? Look, <laughs> I'll tell you what would have happened. Uh, first of all, no, uh, people would have denied that it was true. You have to remember, and, and luckily you don't remember, probably, but this country was so divided that the peace movement would, without any question, have said that this is an invention by a warlike, bloodthirsty administration that has now found another excuse to re-enter the Indochina conflict from which they've just withdrawn or been forced to withdraw. And uh, the Congress had, after all, you have to remember the Congress had cut off military aid to, uh, to Cambodia. And they fought on for four months until literally the ammunition ran out. Mm. So if we had gone to the Congress and said, the thing you cut off, we are now going to want to reinstitute, it was absolutely out of the question. We would have been run out of, uh, we would have been run out of the country. And uh, it really should teach us we cannot afford to conduct foreign policy when our country is so divided. We mustn't let that happen again. You can't conduct foreign policy when the country is divided that way. Well, uh, at that point, uh, really, every, uh, every element of civility had disappeared yeah. in the political dialogue. There is America. no good road map to, that tells us. There's no great prescription that tells us what to do when we know there are huge crimes against humanity, well, take, I, whether it's Bosnia take, or Rwanda. Take Rwanda now. Right. Uh, at least in Bosnia, we did something, uh, maybe late, too late, but in Rwanda... In the end, the war stopped. Yeah, but in Rwanda, hundreds of thousands were killed. 
Now, it is not a country of strategic importance for the United States. You cannot define a national interest that would take us there. And yet, there, I tend to think, uh, I personally would have supported uh, an intervention. In Rwanda? I would have supported it. Even I, though somebody would have come to you and said, Kissinger, you have always said, don't go where we have no right. national interest. Uh, it would have been a violation of what ordinarily is my principle. Ordinarily, I feel you should not risk American objective, uh, American lives uh, for objectives where you cannot explain to the mothers why you did it. Yeah, that's my point. Do you think today, let's, let's assume, I mean, you can't, it's hard to put ourselves back to where Cambodia is because, as you say, of the politics and of the, the fissure in the society at that time, and may very well be. Uh, that no one could have developed an argument to be compelling enough to get the country to be behind it. But, but d I don't know that there is the will in American public, in the public, for America to act. And uh, incidentally, I don't, pl blame, do you? I don't blame President Clinton for not doing it in Rwanda. In Rwanda. Because it's one thing for me to sit here and say it. But if I had sat in the White House and somebody had said, well, you've got to send these units and this and this and this, would I then have done it? Uh, my instinct tells me we should have done it in Rwanda. But then there are lots of killings. Where do you draw the line? Exactly. It, we point. cannot intervene against every unjust killing somewhere in the world. So that's my point. There's no prescription. There's, There's no, no road map no to give you any sense where you can say, this passes the test no. and this doesn't. And this we can ask Americans to risk their lives for somebody. No, and it's also true that if a major country did it to its own people, and you could do it only by a major war, yeah, right. you'd probably have to say no. We yeah, can't and do if that. it was the Russians back at the height of the Cold War, we'd have had to say there's nothing we can do. No, they got no too and many we didn't do it, weapons. and we didn't do it when the Russians were pretty brutal in Chechnya after the Cold War. In Chechnya. In no. Chechnya. Yeah. And I don't, again, I'm not saying this critically, it's a fact of life. And so, you know, it, it, sometimes you run head on into whatever the power dynamic is. You know, you well, might very well say, for example, you may very well say, I mean, this goes back on a different we level in terms of what you can do to influence the conduct of another nation and whether you're willing to exert your power if they have a lot of power and can retaliate. We cannot right every injustice in the world, but we should have a sense when something gets beyond a certain point that we ought to do something. And for you, Rwanda was that, and for you, Bosnia was that, and for you, in retrospect, well, Cambodia was that. No, in Cambodia... In, in terms of the extremity of the act, not in terms of yeah. whether we could have done in it. In Bosnia, when there was a chance, I did try to, uh, to resist, and we were stopped by uh, the inability to get Congress to support it. And the Western, European, and the Western Europeans, too and nobody else, and, and we didn't know, uh, but when we resisted, we were opposed to the communists taking over. It never occurred to us that anyone would kill, would empty the city of Phnom Penh. And if you read the newspaper reports uh, at the time of people who were critical of us for resisting, they were saying nothing could be worse than this war, and these Khmer Rouge, they are sort of agrarian reformers who will want to... Yeah. Uh, so that was the general perception of our critics. We had a harsher one, but not, uh, we never imagined anything like this. But Sidney Shanberg and others were winning Pulitzer Prizes for their reports. No, but Sidney Shanberg, if you read his reports uh, of what he predicted and compared it to what happened, mm -hmm. uh, he, he had a very, very optimistic view about the, uh, about the Khmer Rouge. What's going to happen to Cambodia now? My last question. Well, first of all, the man who's governing Cambodia now is himself of the Pol Pot group. This was a tactical fight with Pol Pot. Secondly, he kicked out the other guy. He was supposed to be the co-prime minister with Chianok San, and he kicked out Shianok San and killed several hundred of Shianok supporters. So <laughs> the methods, maybe not on the same scale, are not so foreign to him. Uh, most people think now you 
that is a fairly that he can govern and uh, probably the civil war will end but it's not going to be a model democracy and uh, the suffering that these people have undergone must have produced a rift in that society and in the souls of people that will take a long time to heal. And the death of Pol Pot will not cure that either. No. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Here. Thank you. We'll be back. Stay with us. Since the debut of his self-titled album in 1982, Wynton Marsalis has recorded more than 30 jazz and classical albums, toured six continents, and performed over 2,000 concerts. He also serves as artistic director for the internationally acclaimed Jazz at Lincoln Center program, which he co-founded in 1987. Among other numerous awards, last year he became the first jazz composer in the history of America to ever win a Pulitzer Prize in music for his epic libretto blood on the fields in between teaching and touring making a 26-part npr series and a four-part pbs series he managed to get to sleep he's also <laughs> recorded another solo cd it is called midnight blues welcome back sir all right how you been how are you doing good let's let's spend the best 10 minutes we've ever spent together tell me what midnight blues is about well midnight blues is uh, it's love songs but all it's right uh, it has uh, songs with a four long quality like yeah. it's about hearts being broken and uh really it's it's it, to find affirmation through that uh that's what the midnight blues is the party's over you're blasé after you've gone yeah. glad to be unhappy it never entered my mind baby won't you please come home i guess i'll hang my tears out to dry i got lost in her arms now are you a romantic at heart <laughs> in, in one in a certain way but not a, I'm not like a gusher, you know. Yeah. Like I, I'm not going to be gushing all over people. Or, you, are you not, also pri are you private about it or? Well, I'm I'm private about it in public. Yeah. But not in private. Now you walked in here with this. This says Passantino. Pas uh, Passantino. Yeah. Passantino. Right. Yeah. Am I yeah. saying that right? Well, I guess I don't. Music know. papers. Uh, what is this? It's just notebooks with music that's due. This <laughs> is music due. You're due. under the gun. I'm under the gun. You got to write, yeah, and you got to get it out. Get it out now. What's this for? It's for the Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center piece that we're doing. Uh, Jazz and Lincoln Center is doing with them, yeah. and it's uh, it's based on the, the Stravinsky's piece. Based His on Stravinsky, Soul Doc. right? Yeah. And what are these little notes? Well, those are notes to myself. I mean, it's hard. But you have to get you a good page so you can really <laughs> see. Like it. it's two different books. Yeah. Oh, I see it. it's two. I can see there's two right. different well, books. Right. That, now that's the one where you got to go back. Yeah. Go back further. Well, I don't want to do that, but I just want to tell you, this right. is a work in progress yeah. right here. Yeah, yeah. 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 You, why do you work so hard? Um, it's fun. This music is what you love. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. It's just uh, the feeling, the feeling that you get from playing and uh, getting things out. The ideas come to you, and you get to put them down. And also, when you work, you, you stay prepared for things when they come to you. And that, that's, that's, the, that's really the... It's like you're always in a, you're always ready. What did the Pulitzer mean to you? Well, it, it just, it meant uh, recognition for our music. And, uh, you know, for me, just the fact that the committee with musicians on it too, they sat down with a score and they checked it out and they found something worthy in the music, that meant something uh, to me, mainly because as a jazz musician, you, your, your music and whatever your, your actual artistic achievement right. is never really, uh, you, you you don't get too much, either recognition or or not even recognition for it. You you won't get cut you won't get cut down because of it, and you won't be celebrated because you, of it. Yeah. Are you by nature a lightning rod for? Uh, you know, I don't, controversy. I don't think it's me. I don't I don't think it's really. It's just uh. Um. It's, it's, it's difficult for me to find a way to, to, to combine the words to express it. But I think that a lot of times you come into a situation and there's tremendous amounts of corruption, which is also 
with with has power, and you just you just not gonna really go for that in public. You can't. You can't. I can't do that. You can't stand by and let it pass. I just can't do it, man. Even even the older I get, the less. When I was younger, I was a lot more fiery. And what's at the highest? What is at the top of that list for you? Just misrepresentation, willful misrepresentation for sales or for to titillate or any just willful misrepresentation. Well, you must look around America today and find a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff. A here. Sense of absence of values and standards and. Well, yeah, but I, you know, and I, I, I find that, but I don't look at it in a moral sense. Or well, in a, moral, in a, but I mean in a sense of taste and yes, and, I and see a that. quality of excellence and that kind of stuff. I, I see that, but I also see that, that that that's not what people want. It's just that 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 voice of the people is never heard, and we will accept whatever we get. We will accept it. Okay, yeah, if you want me to go through this, I'll go through it. But that's not what we want. And and this is what I we know to be true. We want to be inspired, challenged, taken to a place that's that, right. that very few go. And we want something with love in it. And we want we don't want to be at each other's throat, but we will be. We we don't we will do that. But we want to get in the elevator in the morning and somebody say, Good morning. We want that. But we also will accept, you know, standing there going. Yeah. So we take we accept the the we 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 accept compromises to the best of us. We, well, yeah, and then sometimes it becomes the way that things are, and that's that's the thing. And I'm always it, things can be any way, way that we make them. How much of what you are is about sort of being like your father? A lot of it, a, a lot I learned from my father because he struggled his entire life with uh, popularity and playing, and you know whether to keep playing. What about music? And 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 he uh. He, he has a lot of integrity, and he also would share the information with me. Like, like when I did this album, I called my father, man, what song should I... Oh, is that right? Should I, should I use? He said, well, this is a good one. As a matter of fact, we, we, we were, when we got together, we were at the piano. I called him, and then I, I went to New Orleans, and we, we played through songs. It reminded me of when I was in high school again, you know? And he's playing the songs, and he's telling me, hey, this is a nice one right here. Did you once say that the, you didn't think there was anything worse than a jazz musician playing funk? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I said, there's nothing sadder than that funk the jazz musicians play, man. Oh, Lord, have mercy. What's the great dream for you? The great, great, great dream for me is to go around America one day when I'm old and hear, hear bands playing all over and to see a lot of adults come back and play. Yeah. And, and I, if I really, and, and, the, and not just to be playing, but to be playing with the type of soul and feeling that was first stated in New Orleans with, with people like Sidney Bechet and Louis Armstrong, like the feeling of that music, that everybody understand that that's for all of us and that we all can achieve that type of expression. You have got to go to work, uh, and I'm going to let you out early because I've got to do some stuff here. Uh, this is your home. Come back anytime, my friend. Thank you, Charles. I'm going to play this tonight when I drive out to the country. Wenton Marsalis, The Midnight Blues, Standard Time, Volume 5. Uh, he is clearly, in my judgment, uh, without any serious musical qualifications, uh, one of the great figures in American music and clearly the best trumpet player we've had in a long time. Thank you, buddy. Thanks. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Harvard biologist Edward O. Wilson is one of the nation's most important and famous scientists. His studies on human nature and ants have earned him two Pulitzer Prizes. He helped pioneer the fields of biodiversity and sociobiology. He is widely regarded for his breadth of knowledge and boldness of inquiry. His latest book, Consilience, calls for the fundamental unity of all knowledge. I am very pleased to have him back on this program. Welcome back. Thank you so much. It's good to have you uh, here. I want to start with this, yeah. and, and we're going to work around some very interesting ideas. Quote, the major unsolved problem now is how the hundred billion nerve cells of the brain work together to create consciousness. Correct. The that is the major unsolved, unsolved problem, problem of the natural sciences. Okay. And as we approach some kind of a solution to that major problem, then we approach the articulation and possibly the solution to what I call the major unsolved problem of the social sciences, which is, which is the linkage between mind and culture and uh, also between 
genetic evolution, which we know has an effect on culture, and cultural evolution, which has served as a milieu in which the genetic evolution of the brain and the mind has occurred over the past few hundred thousand years. You want to make what point about the mind and consciousness? The point I want to make... It's fundamental to what's going yes, on. Yes, exactly. And then we can come to a right. definition of the word right. consilience. Right. Uh, the fundamental point is that the natural sciences have now expanded and grown rich enough uh, so as to enter what I like to call the borderland areas between the natural sciences, particularly the biological sciences and the social sciences, while some of the social sciences, like cognitive psychology and biological anthropology, have entered from their side, and we are now approaching what appears to be a remarkable bridging effort. My curiosity, helpful, will be where the audience is. Some would like to think that the mind and consciousness is something out there that we don't quite know. You believe it is all about understanding how the physical science of the brain works. If we get that and understand molecular biology and understand cells, we'll understand what the mind is. I believe that, and more importantly, uh, so do the great majority of neurobiologists who work on uh, the physical basis of mind. They believe that at, uh, in, in a fairly short period of time, we will have learned enough about the way the brain is put together. We already know a great deal, but how it's put together but also through two new techniques in brain imaging, uh, just what the physical uh, uh, processes that constitute uh, consciousness uh, is. So that if we un begin to understand that, which is the big question for all of us, yes. we'll understand what made Michelangelo a genius? I'm not sure whether we can do that in any foreseeable future. That is, define... But that's where we're going. Well, I think we are. Uh, in time, because I, I don't see creative genius as something that is truly transcendent, but rather uh, is the extreme expression of gifts and, and creative processes within all of us. But Explained when we come, by genes. Yes. Well, ultimately, right. yes. Uh, I don't think that we'll come uh, to understand Michelangelo any sooner than we will understand uh, the origin of the magnificence, shall we say, of a tropical rainforest, but we're headed in that direction. But it is explainable down the road as far as you're concerned That is as the a basic scientist. proposition of consilience. And I might add, it's not just my idiosyncratic view. Consilience, incidentally, that's a word that goes back 160 years in the philosophy and history of science, but, and now I'm trying to pull it out into the mainstream. Uh, because it's a pretty word, is it not? Yeah, it sounds nice. Uh, and also, it it's, has retained its exact meaning, which means the interlocking of cause and effect uh, explanations across different disciplines. Does it mean also the unity of all knowledge? It was eventually the proposition that I'm making, the so-called yeah. uh, consilience program or proposition or metaphysics, however you wish to ex express it, uh, uh, suggests that, uh, yes, that that would be the case, uh, uniting at a fundamental cause and effect material basis uh, all of the branches of learning. So from what you've written about sociobiology and what you've written about biodiversity, how did you come to this? Well, uh, I was poised throughout as an evolutionary biologist. That is, a biologist who is mainly concerned with the processes and the products of organic evolution. And because uh, my work throughout my career has dealt with social animals, hence a book I wrote 23 years ago called Sociobiology, right. I naturally had uh, my mind uh, focused uh, at times on human social behavior. And so it has always been a dream of mine that somehow the uh, same explanations fundamentally uh, secured by the biological science of the origin of animal societies up to and including, say, chimpanzee social science would find relevance in the understanding of human behavior. I think that's a view that now has gained, gained a, a great deal of uh, credence. And what do you worry about, some would argue, 
that you worry that there's huge danger if the social sciences are not speaking to the physical sciences, if they're going off in separate directions, because it's only by coming together. Yeah, that's primarily my argument, and it's a large part of the practical argument. When you look at the social sciences today, they have a lot of strengths, and they've achieved a great deal, and they include uh, in their services uh, some of the brightest people in the country. What but they achieve, for example? Uh, well, they haven't achieved nearly as much as they should have. <laughs> <laughs> I should say their, their track record for all of the faith and all of the funding we've put into them has not been impressive. Uh, that's partly due to the enormous complexity of the subject, the historicity, for example, but it's also due fundamentally to the fact that they do not have a theory. In order to have a theory, the way biology has a theory, chemistry, physics yeah. have a theory, you have to have a foundation. And that foundation has to be consilient exploration of the next levels of organization below that level of complexity that you're studying. If you're studying culture and society, human society, then you must understand mind. And they haven't done very well at adopting even what we know about mind. And in order to understand the human mind, which in aggregate produces culture, you need to understand the biology of the brain. They haven't done that. Do they recognize the importance of it? They're beginning to. Uh, I've taken particular aim, uh, friendly, congenial, collegial <laughs> aim at, uh, the, uh, at economics. I, I've picked out the, what is generally the strongest and uh, uh, most prestigious of the social sciences to analyze this problem right. and right. point out that the, uh, the difficulty, a key difficulty with uh, economics is that it doesn't have a foundation. It, when it talks about uh, motives in microeconomics, you right. know, what makes people buy things or, or make certain choices uh, that affect uh, the economy. Uh, generally, uh, they deal with what we call folk psychology. There's the intuition of the economist, not with what we actually know from the science of cognitive psychology, yeah. much less uh, biology of how the brain works. That's got to change. What do they give to each other in terms of, on the one hand, social sciences, and on the other hand, the physical sciences, because there must be something that you scientists can get from philosophers, historians, political scientists, mm -hmm. and the like. Well, what is it? from uh, and we can poets, get all for example. kinds of things that we can get from one another. What do you get As from a I've poet? As I said, uh, the uh, what we get from uh, po uh, we can get from poetry. The science is badly needed. Is in fact the poetry, uh, the uh, spiritual charge of the beauty of a creative act which scientists engage in in, in a way that's quite parallel to uh, what uh, uh, carries along the poet uh, uh, themselves. But note, uh, even if you look at this from a point of view operationally of a natural scientist looking for new things to discover, and believe me, that's the profession of natural scientists, to discover. You discover uh, if you discover, then you're a success. If you don't discover, discover something, it doesn't matter how much you know, how wise you are, you are not a success as a natural scientist. So natural scientists look for new problems, and what the social sciences and the humanities offer in vast wealth to us natural sciences now are problems to solve. It's in this uh, broad area, still largely unexplored, between biology of the mind and the social sciences. Now, social sciences offers to pure sciences, some would say, or nat physical sciences, natural sciences, problems to solve. Uh, precisely. And new areas to open up. And they offer to you poetry, passion. They offer to us those problem areas. We offer to them, oh, you offer them. a foundation. Uh, that is, foundational disciplines to connect up with. It doesn't mean that uh, it's proposed that uh, the social sciences and humanities are going to be reduced to anything. They'll grow richer. It's just that they will have more of a uh, full material, consilient explanation with all of the information and knowledge that has come from the, uh, from the natural sciences. You once said an ideal scientist, I reminded you of this earlier, an ideal scientist thinks like a poet, works like a bookkeeper, little notes, little notes, <laughs> oh, little notes, uh, every little detail written down, right. and if gifted with a full quiver, writes like a journalist. That's right. Tell me how a scientist should think like a poet. The ex uh, many people think that uh, scientists proceed by some kind of uh, ironclad, um, literal system of logic, looking at 
masses of data and then deciding that there's some kind of, of relationship or law there that they must puzzle out like working a Sunday crossword puzzle. That isn't the way science works at all. The greatest scientist, Einstein's example, Newton and other, uh, take great leaps of the imagination. They have a certain body of information, often sparse in nature at the beginning, and they envision from that bit of information what might be going on uh, in the world of a very general sort, and then they think through uh, what the, the process uh, might be more explicitly, and then they define the bodies of empirical information that need to be uncovered and, uh, and verified in order to test, that is, verify or, or discard that, uh, that body of theory. Is, do you feel that science has gotten the appropriate respect or every bit that it should have? Uh, yes. Okay. I think scientists, uh, the, uh, natural sciences are much respected in uh, most of Western societies. Do you as an individual need the, just based on what you just said about leaping forward, Galileo and others, mm -hmm. Newton, need the sense of science's order, that, that the notion, you, there's an interesting quote you once made about order and chaos, mm -hmm. you know, need the sort of structure that science gives you. Well, I believe that intellectually people hunger for that structure and order. And I believe further that the spectacular success, I hope I'm not uh, over-promoting my, uh, my uh, branch of learning, but uh, the spectacular success of the natural sciences indicates that uh, the most productive way of looking at the world, and I believe that goes on up even to the theory of the social science of the humanities, uh, is through the scientific method. The Atlantic Monthly has run April and March. E.O. Wilson, back from chaos. Enlightenment thinkers need a lot, knew a lot of, about everything today. Specialists know a lot about a little. And postmodernists doubt that we can know anything at all. Uh, that's one point you disagree with. It's Certainly. Great force. Mm -hmm. Jacques Derrida and the rest of them take that yes. from you. Yes. Uh, one of the century's most important scientists, you, argues against fashion that we can know what we need to know and that we will discover underlying all forms of knowledge if underlying all forms of knowledge of fundamental unity. Here is the April 1998 Atlantic Monthly, the biological basis of morality. Morality has a biological basis. Why not? I think that the evidence is increasingly uh, strong that uh, it is a um, a production, the moral uh, forms of moral reasoning that we have, and the ethical precepts of the human mind, Comes and from biology. Uh, from certainly, let's make a, a fundamental distinction that the philosophers have not laid before us adequately and made clear that there are two possibilities, two ways of thinking: the transcendental, which is that moral precepts exist outside the human species and are there like mathematical laws of physics for us to discuss, or are the word of God for us to discover through scripture and revelation. That's one worldview, one way of looking at it. And the other is the empiricist view that um, we have uh, evolved uh, the, um, eth uh, the, the ethical precepts that we have uh, as, a, as, a, as a means, a necessary means of survival, that we enter into uh, contracts and uh, consensual agreements that uh, are strengthened by making them into law and sacred oath. So there are the two competing systems and of they're thought. In, and, they're in, and they're incompatible. They are, in, they are fundamentally incompatible, and we might as well just put that on the table, lay the cards face up, and renew the, uh, the discussion about morality and religion okay, on that but basis. It, you say they're incompatible, but you also say with respect to religion, it is, the, I think, you tell me what you well, say. Well, you were <laughs> about to introduce something, a very important disclaimer. Okay, go ahead. Uh, that uh, will rescue me from serious trouble. Okay. Uh, but it is, it, is, uh, it is given, I think, uh, from, from the heart as well as from the mind, that uh, uh, the, the empiricist, the humanist, must recognize that having evolved our sense of morality, our sense of religion, is one of the deepest embedded in our genes in the sense that uh, we are extremely prone uh, to develop uh, religious uh, belief and uh, 
moral uh, th uh, forms of moral reasoning uh, just uh, to uh, survive that have become extremely deep in our psyche and to dismiss that then as so much mythology that we can be trained out of is a serious mistake. What do you want one to come away with from this book? I want to come away with a uh, uh, having shifted, if I'm able, or helped to shift, the entire frame of discourse about human nature and the human condition. And there are a lot of reasons why I'd like to see that happen. The, uh, the opportunities for future research and understanding from both sides of the culture line that has uh, separated the natural sciences and social sciences and humanities are one thing, uh, to, uh, to explore and consider this uh, proposition of uh, consilient explanation. But in opening a new uh, inquiry and general discussion about it, hopefully with mutual respect on all sides, uh, I would like to see the liberal arts in colleges and universities revitalized. The liberal arts are in terrible condition and declining precisely in my mind because they're focused on the wrong frame of discourse. If they will focus on the relation of the great branches of learning in this manner, they will have a lot to talk about and a lot to learn quickly. And the natural sciences will give them that in part. Well, and furthermore, uh, the humanities and the social sciences can be given to the natural sciences in a manner uh, that will be exciting to them and, uh, and, and complete their education. The natural sciences need it as much as the social sciences and humanities. You have studied ants exhaustively. That <laughs> is one claim that I can make <laughs> without embarrassment. Yes, you can. <laughs> Apart from this yes. and, and, and looking to the unity of knowledge, you know, what other kinds of inquiries are tantalizing to you uh, that, that, uh, that demand your attention? I thought you would never ask. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, one of the nice things about uh, getting out to the border of our expanding knowledge, yeah. I just happen to be located there because I'm an evolutionary biologist, uh, is to, uh, to have a somewhat clearer view of what it is that we most need to know. And one area that I think is opening up for exploration that's going to be a major area in the advance of science because it presents so many of the challenges uh, that uh, we value uh, in, uh, in the sciences and all scholarship, as a matter of fact, is uh, the uh, construction of ecosystems. We call it community ecology. It is how are whole ecosystems put together, you know, in the same way the organisms put together, how are they created, how are they sustained. This is an area in its infancy and wide open uh, for further expo how they exploration. How do the species, particularly, yeah. of the ecosystems, marsh, rainforest, desert, that uh, uh, represent the living community, that right. part of, the, of an ecosystem, how did they get there? Why do certain species live together and others are incompatible to create that ecosystem? What sustains it? And uh, how is it evolving as a, as a unit? We know extremely little about this still in biology. It's one of the uh, most mm -hmm. promising in terms of new discoveries, uh, areas of, of biology ahead of us, and one that I happen to have a particular interest in. This book is Consilience, the Unity of Knowledge. Edward O. Wilson, two-time Pulitzer Prize winner for his signed, written books about his scientific inquiry. Um, much talk. He has been involved in some of the great debates uh, having to do with science and nature and nurture and a lot of other issues. Uh, now a call for more liberal arts education in our schools and a concern about uh, sciences going off on their own and not benefiting from the natural exchange between all of them. I thank you for joining us. Thank you for the opportunity. We'll see you next time.
Charlie Rose is made possible by USA Networks as part of our continuing commitment to innovative television. Through USA Network and the Sci-Fi Channel, we provide original entertainment to America and the world. Anywhere, anytime, any book. BarnesandNoble.com where the world shops for books. Cisco Systems, the company that brought the Internet to business, is pleased to help bring the Charlie Rose Show to PBS. Cisco Systems, empowering the Internet generation. Charlie Rose is also made possible by these funders. And by Bloomberg, a provider of multimedia news and information services worldwide. To order Charlie Rose program transcripts and video cassettes, call 1 800 All News or write to the address on your screen. Please indicate show date and guest. This is PBS. On the next Charlie Rose, a perspective on world economics with the French economics minister, also Wendy Wasserstein and Nick Heitner, about their new film. Join us.